Um, the presentation I'm about to give is actually a presentation I'm going to give for an IBM thing uh, in a few weeks, and so it's supposed to be a longer presentation, so I'm going to go to a very high level and, and not talk about some of the details. If you're interested in those, we've, we've published some papers on this in, in scientific journals and whatnot, and I can have you talk about it afterwards. Um, so again, as Tom said, I'm, I'm from the School of Informatics and Computing at IU. Um, so you look at the computer, you look at things like the cloud, you look at things like hardware like Google Glass, some you might be familiar with. Um, it's, a continuing story that goes back for the last hundred thousand years of human history of offloading sort of things that we used to have to do in our head into the tools in our environment. Um, and it is in a lot of ways the story of civilization. Um, now in, you know, we'd, we'd like to think in healthcare that this is the way things work, that we have electronic health records that sort of do what we do in our head externally and you get these really cool like interfaces and they're like Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever and you press things and screens fly around in three dimensions. Of course, anybody who works with electronic health records, no, they don't quite look like this. Um, <laughs> But it's kind of the vision, right? The vision is we have these things that integrate into the way that we think about the problem, and they help us do what we're trying to do better. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of the vision, this is the dream. But just to get back to the point, it's really just a continuation of something that has been going on since the dawn of civilization. Um, in reality, a lot of times when we have data nowadays, you know, what we get are things like this, where we get these sort of line graphs or whatever that kind of tell us about trends, you know, that maybe give us some information about what's going on or whatnot. And this is helpful. It's definitely helpful. It's better to make decisions based on information than based on, you know, no information, right? But at the same time, it doesn't really tell us what to do. In other words, it doesn't integrate into the way that we think about the problem, or it doesn't really answer the sort of the challenges we face. Um, in decision making, whether that be clinical decision making or, or decision making in daily life. And so while this is important and this is you know, definitely a step in the right direction, we can do definitely a lot better than simply showing graphs on a screen. Um, and the example I like to give when I give talks is I talk about driving a car. So uh, say you're, you're in your car and you're about to make a right turn and you start to make the right turn and you sort of make that decision, you go through the sort of physical process of doing it and you don't just keep turning the car, you don't just make that decision and then do it there's this constant feedback. So if a pedestrian walks across the crosswalk, you change your plan. You sort of change what you're thinking about doing. You constantly are reevaluating the way you go about the process that you're doing. And it's not simply a matter of making a decision by looking at some current information and just going through with it. It's about this perceptual feedback, right? Um, and so this notion of constantly sort of this, inner, this sort of loop between the perceptions we have or the information we have about the environment and the actions that we take are kind of key for us to do any of the tasks that we do in a daily, in a daily sort of uh, situation, whether that be driving the car or providing clinical care. We're constantly getting information back about what we do. So how does this work in a clinical setting? Um, and I'm going to switch gears and talk about something closer to what might make sense in here is this notion of sort of building a pipeline. So, you know, we have data, we have clinical data, and we can definitely do some modeling of it, the things we've talked about, you know, just before this, about, you know, finding patterns that sort of form predictions, and then we can theoretically use those to help us make better decisions about what we're going to do. But the point that I want to make today is that we can actually do, do better by looping these all around, so that we actually take advantage of the temporal nature of the connection between all these sort of aspects of the way that we make decisions and can act, actually make better decisions. Instead of just looking at data and making a decision and move forward, we constantly loop back and forth between the things that, uh, that, uh, that kind of, uh, sort of the, the, the aspects of the decision making process. Um, so give it like a sort of a, sort of a concrete example. So we can, we can build models off of this, right? We can make predictions. Say we have data, we have clinical data, we have genetic data, socio-demographic data, maybe we have data from mobile devices or imaging data. It doesn't really matter. We can build models off this. It doesn't matter what the model is. We could talk all day long about different kinds of models, whether it be neural networks or, or other kinds of models, statistical techniques. We can look at hospitalization or you know, risk stratification. It doesn't really matter. The point is that we can build models, that we have data and that we can build models. And we can argue about what the right model is, but we can build models, okay? Those models give us patterns. They tell us about things that we expect to see based on the data, right? And those patterns are really predictions about the future in a sense. And we have lots and lots of these kind of predictions. They form the basis of transition models, which in a sense are 
Transition models tell us about the way the world changes over time. So here I have a very simple example of an, of an economics or transition model that just tells us probabilistically how the world's going to change over time. So we have lots and lots of predictions. We get these sort of, we get a way to understand the way that the world is going to change based on what we're seeing and based on a constant loop of feedback of information. Um, and in the healthcare setting, a very, very simple example of this is something that looks a little like this. So we may, the patient may have a certain sort of status um, that may be, say, how, the, how well they're doing with some outcome measure. Um, and we have observations about that. So I mean, you know, the patient's state may actually be a diagnosis. So maybe it's diabetes and the observation are like blood glucose readings. Then we infer the person's diabetes and how well they're doing based on the blood glucose readings. We do various treatments that affects the person's state. And over time, they accumulate certain improvements or deteriorations outcomes, hopefully not. And there's also certain costs that are associated with those sort of decisions. And again, this is all built around the notion of sort of thinking about the problem over time. This, if you look at this, uh, this uh, slide up here, it's very important to notice that these things occur over time. And so there's information from what happened before that's feeding into what we're doing right now, but also feeding into what we're about to do. And as we do things, it changes the world. As we, as we do treatments, as we drive a car, when we do things, it changes what we're about to see. And there's a connection between what we do and what we observe that we can actually use to make better decisions, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. Um, that th th there's a connection between those two. And oftentimes, those things are disconnected in the way we think about data. A lot of times, we think about sort of, you know, we have data and we make decisions. We don't realize that those decisions, decisions influence future observations, influence future data. That's so why bootstrapping, using that, we can actually leverage that to actually understand better the process of, say, clinical care. Um, and in a more complicated example, um, you, you basically have some way of, uh, some utility, some way of measuring the decisions that you're making um, based on all this information that you're getting. So these outcomes and these costs, um, you can measure those and you can actually then model in a very finite way the utility of the decisions you're making and you can actually figure out what the optimal sequence of decisions are over the course of time, optimal sequence of actions or decisions are over the course of time based on this sort of perceptual feedback, this sort of loop between data and between the sort of the actions you take and between the observations, the way that you're going to affect the world through those, those various treatment actions. Um, and we've actually published this. I'm starting to get into the stuff we've actually published. The thing I want to emphasize here that I think is important um, in the limited time that I have is that um, this is constantly planning and replanning over time. So this What's really critical here is that you're not making a decision and making a treatment recommendation and putting something you know, in a clinical decision support system and making a recommendation and say, here, do this treatment. We're constantly reevaluating. So we may make a recommendation, and then the person may change. They may get better. They may get worse. And then we're replanning, reevaluating, and we're coming up with a different sequence of actions over time. Not simply what's the next best treatment, but what's the next best series of treatments over the next five sessions we're going to see somebody, if that makes sense. Um, it's also important to understand that this works in the area of belief states. So I think some of the questions that happened, uh, came up before were, we don't quite know what somebody's diagnosis is, or maybe we're missing observations at a particular time point about somebody's outcomes or somebody's you know, clinical indicators or whatnot. That's OK. We can deal with that in a probabilistic manner. It doesn't, we don't have to know for certain what somebody's diagnosis is. It's OK that it is probabilistic. It's OK that we may be missing observations sometime. We can deal with that within the model in a very sort of elegant way. Um, and what makes it interesting is then, of course, building this pipeline is we can then insert this stuff into basically multi-agent systems. So we have these digital sort of avatars, if you want to think of them, of the doctor, of the patient, that take the characteristics of the actual patient. So they have all the, uh, the, the characteristics that the patient have, their diagnosis, their clinical observations, their actual outcomes, um, all the information that we have about the patient. So they take on basically the, the characteristic of the patient sort of in a digital world. And same thing with the doctor, because every doctor, every clinician is different from each one. And we can actually build models that actually leverage, basically, these things, these sort of predictions that we have from the simpler models to build things that actually basically work through the whole clinical process alongside the actual ongoing clinical process and actually then feedback information about here's what's going to happen in the future and constantly be reevaluating those things. So as, they, as people maybe um, actually commit to certain treatment choices, actually look at the, the effects of those and actually say, okay, that actually didn't work. So it actually learns over time um, constantly as, you know, as it sort of, uh, as it gets information back. Um, 
and we actually uh, have done this and we published it. Um, and we, are, we did this with about 10,000 patients from CRI. We posted this uh, earlier this year in the uh, journal Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. Myself and Chris Hauser, who's a professor uh, at IU, formerly at Stanford. Um, and basically what we showed, just to summarize this graph, was that when you take this approach, when you take this approach of linking what you're doing to what you're observing, and you, do, you kind of use these temporal models to this perceptual feedback, that you can basically improve outcomes, like double the outcomes for half the cost. So it's basically a four-fold increase. Um, and that's basically what we show here. I can't go into a lot of details, but we I use functioning outcomes and, and other things and whatnot. Um, but what I, what I would like to say is that it's not an indictment of clinicians. Clinicians work within a certain environment. Um, they're paid for service volume, obviously, and not for um, providing necessarily the, the best outcome just to be honest with you. So this is really sort of an indictment of the system. The way that the models work, whether it's capacitation or fee-for-service, emphasizes certain things that make it difficult for clinicians to do the right thing. But when we use these models, we can actually do much better. So this is actually a much better approach than, say, an insurance capacitation agreement, because we actually can figure out what's optimal in terms of cost effectiveness, if that makes sense. The other thing I like to emphasize is, because it's probabilistic, um, it actually deals well with sort of these Bayesian probabilities, uh, and that's where it gains a lot of its advantages because it doesn't ha have to worry about actually getting an accurate diagnosis. It doesn't have to worry about missing observation or having all the information um, sort of there, if that makes sense. And people, as we know, are not good with Bayesian probabilities in their head. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, part of this is offloading the things that clinicians or that people have to do in their heads into you know, into, uh, into the computer, basically. These, these are normally the, you know, building things that kind of think like a clinician does, so the clinician can focus on delivering care and not focus on trying to do, like, math in their head. Um, I mean, you know, trying to do Bayesian stuff in people's head, trying to figure out probabilities, that's the, that's the entire basis of, like, the gambling industry, right? People are not very good at it. Um, so, again, building a pipeline. So, um, and I don't, if you can flash some time. Couple more minutes. Okay. Um, so th that's very quickly like a 30 minute like talk to condense into 10 minutes. Um, I left out a lot of stuff. We have some papers on it. I can discuss more like what I'm actually talking about. But the point is taking like what a person does in their head and putting it into a system that thinks like they do so that it can help them do what they do better. That's really the emphasis here is not necessarily replacing people or saying that people do a bad job. It's simply that like, we want to build technology that does what people are trying to do but helps them do it better by, taking the, by thinking the way they think. Because if it thinks in a different way or if it just provides data in a line graph, it's limiting in some ways, if that makes sense. Um, and let's skip through some of this stuff. And mostly move to here. It, it, this is a mechanic, obviously. These are the Lagrange equations that actually make your engine work. But I guarantee the mechanic at your auto service center, at your local Jiffy Loop, has no idea what any of that means, but he can still work on your car. And part of the process of making better technology, of making things better, is by finding ways to simplify what things work so that people don't have to necessarily know physics. They don't have to understand how to do um, Bayesian probabilities in their head. They don't have to... Um, you know, they don't have to do a lot of the things that actually make things complex. So by simplifying things, we actually allow people to focus on different aspects of the task and to do those aspects better. Um, in the same token in science, whether it be, um, you know, whether it be biology there on the left or it be sort of understanding the universe on the right, it seemed very complicated at first glance, you know. But, you know, eventually people come along these people, and they say, you know, look, it's actually really not that complicated. There's actually simple ways to think about things that seem just amorphous, that seem like impossible problems for anybody to ever to understand, but yet we find that whether it be the universe or whether it be the tree of life, that they're actually not that complicated or that they may seem at first glance. And certainly I think that if this is true of the universe, it's probably true of things that exist in the universe like healthcare. Um, and the same notion, you know, this also extends into stuff that people have been talking about in psychology for the last, you know, 30 years. If you're familiar with the work of J.J. Gibson, things like cognitive scaffolding, that even the way we move around the world, the way that we see the world is actually based very much on cues in the environment. That in order to understand what we're seeing, we actually bootstrap based on the way we move through the world and invariant features. Um, uh, this notion of cognitive scaffolding, and, and this is actually the key part of what IBM and some other people are now talking about. There's this buzzword now of cognitive computing, 
um, that you hear, they're applying it to Watson, they're applying to other things. And the idea, again, is reconceptualizing the way that we build systems that people interface with so that they help offload a lot of the tasks that people are forced to do in their head, a lot of the computation that people are forced to sort of um, accomplish in order so that they can focus on other things. In the healthcare uh, realm, this may be on actually delivering patient care. So if doctor, you know, I've, I've had this experience, a lot of you have probably too, a lot of times when you go to your primary care doc, now they spend like most of the time staring at the computer instead of looking over at you. And that's probably not the way that the clinical sort of, uh, uh, sort of clinical visit should probably go, right? These things should just integrate in with the way that people think so that people can focus on other aspects of it. Because I know we all love doing math in our head, but um, you know, it probably makes sense to, uh, to do other things. And I'm gonna skip the last slide and just say that even though what I'm talking about might seem weird in some ways, that again, this is really just an extension of what humans have been doing for the last 100,000 years. Ever since we figured out how to chisel stuff in the stone, ever since we figured out how to draw like cave art, this is an extension of offloading from, it, from the, the, the things that go on in our head and into the world around us. Um, a lot of the research I do is actually robotics. Um, and so embedding some of this stuff into robots is actually something that's going on. The one on the left, I don't really have time to show, but I have a video, it's pretty cool, uh, of Actroid F. If you're bored at work sometime, you can go uh, look. It's really lifelike. The one on the right is Paro, um, a, a robot that uh, we work with that does stuff uh, with the seniors and uh, people with dementia and stuff. Uh, we have a number of ongoing collaborations. Well, what I talked about today is sort of stage one clinical trials, if you will, will it's stuff in the lab. You know, so a lot of the, the slides I show where this is how it would work. You know, when we pull, I mean, we're using real patients, we're using real patient data to generate all the numbers that you saw, but at the same time, we're not actually like putting that back in the clinical practice. So we have some interesting sort of collaborations going on, uh, like Regan Street and, and Marshfield, we just received a grant from NIH to do some stuff to actually take this out and try to put it into clinical practice. I think what's uh, important about this and the kind of the last thing I would like to say is um, all this stuff sounds really good, I think, and it's, it's sort, of, um, sort of the next wave, the sort of notion of cognitive computing, but it's really important for us to develop collaborations uh, with people, with clinicians, with various people, as many as possible, so that we can test these kind of ideas um, actually, actually out in the sort of the clinical realm. Um, so, and we're working with various things, not just mental health, but also diabetes and cognitive, uh, or, I'm sorry, congestive heart failure with the people from Stanford. Um, and so, yeah, so we're definitely interested in working with people who, um, you know, find this interesting and, and uh, whatnot. So hopefully I've got time. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.